Thank you. Uh, it occurs to me that this coming July will be the 232nd anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, which makes the Declaration of Independence a younger sibling to the collected experience of these three gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you certainly wouldn't know it to look at them or to hear them work. Um, their resumes are amazing. I'm just going to hit a few things because what, one of the things that strikes me is how much these three gentlemen have in common. They are all pianists, of course. They are all composers. They have all worked in idioms that combine jazz, classical music, church music, uh, not to mention blues. That goes without saying. They are all uh, uh, people who have worked uh, outside of jazz and other media. Uh, they have been involved in radio, television. Uh, but I think the thing that I sort of want to focus on just for a minute is very often in jazz there's a virus that goes around that uh, really dedicated jazz enthusiasts resent someone who achieves great popularity. <laughs> there's a lot of popularity here on this stage. <laughs> and it's one of the things I most admire about them because they have taken jazz to areas that very few musicians have managed to take it. Um, to begin with the, the baby of the group, I was in high school when, when uh, the in crowd came out, and it was amazing because it's a piano trio. You know, there's no strings, there's no voices except the shouting, and in those days the top 40 was just all rock and roll. And Ramsey Lewis cracked it, and he kept cracking it, and he became an important radio and television figure. He's written for every kind of music, his technique is awesome. And uh, that seems to me just to be a, a, a major achievement when you can keep the audience that you know, doesn't spend its entire life memorizing solos still loving the music and interested in it. Um, Billy Taylor, I I've known for a very long time, but I feel like I've known him much longer because the other thing about high school is that when 3 o'clock came, we, the few of us who were jazz fanatics ran to a radio to get WLIB where Billy Taylor was broadcasting. I mean, there wasn't a lot of jazz on radio. And Billy Taylor, Dr. Billy Taylor, had an ability to be enthusiastic and to be contagious in his enthusiasm. And man, I bought a lot of records because of you. <laughs> uh, but then, uh, you know, he's a wonderful composer. He wrote, I just learned in the 1950s, one of the tunes that became uh, emblematic of the civil rights movement, uh, especially after Nina Simone recorded, I wish I knew how it would feel to be free, and a lot of other great tunes, Apiento and Billy's Beat. But uh, he has almost single-handedly kept jazz alive on, uh, or at least he was the first, certainly, on radio and then on television. I think everybody has seen him and everybody has enjoyed watching him. Uh, Dave Brubeck, my goodness. I, I, uh, Dave Brubeck is one of those people who uh, generations have come to jazz because of his music. Certainly mine did. It was Take Five and Blue Rondo a la Turk. And an earlier generation, it was The Duke and In, Her, In Your Own Sweet Way. Um, I'm talking about popularity, and yet when I go back and listen to Dave's early records, it seems like he does everything possible to avoid popularity. I mean, go back to Oberlin. They're all like 12 minute tracks, completely improvised. You can hardly hear the original tunes, and yet they're completely irresistible, and audiences love them and have been loving them, him ever since. Um, in 1958, Dave was one of the people who uh, became one of the State Department uh, representatives. He took a tour to the Middle East and the Far East, and uh, a few years later, he and his wife, a truly gifted lyricist, Iola Brubeck, wrote a remarkable show about that experience called The Real Ambassadors. And that's sort of the, uh, the, 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 what, what generated this, this afternoon. So please welcome these three wonderful, wonderful men. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to uh, begin with a general question, and anybody can jump in. Uh, in those days of the 1950s, the cultural diplomacy days, there was a Cold War, and we were sort of exchanging jazz for ballet uh, with the Soviet Union. And uh, there was a feeling that uh, you know, jazz represented American art. 
But today, to most Americans, jazz and ballet are often considered elitist, precious areas. I mean, would that work today? Could, could, can jazz represent Americanism around the world, or is it, or is it already so implanted that it, that it does? Anybody? I think, I think it already has. And uh, <clears throat> when uh, uh, both of uh, my friends here uh, travel, uh, we travel all over the world, and, and uh, the music um, is international uh, because we're working, each of us is working with international groups and um, students uh, who come to us and who do uh, uh, things in the spirit of the jazz masters. And that's the thing that's very exciting to me because uh, they have gotten it when my home audience here in Washington, D.C. and in other places in New York uh, hasn't gotten it. And, and you know, they, they, these are kids who come from uh, uh, Russia, come, come from, uh, name the place, they come from there, and they, they have assimilated so much of, of uh, our, uh, what we do when we play jazz. Uh, it's, um, it is universal now in terms of, of being uh, all over the world. Mm -hmm. I don't know why uh, uh, most people you ex excluded in this uh, uh, don't don't uh, write much much more about this because every time I read something about jazz they tell me it's dead and I'm, I'm uh, get in in uh, with young kids who are keeping it alive for me anyway mm -hmm. and, and doing wonderful things and uh, adding so much to what we all do and we all do that uh, Dave you won't remember this but the first time I ever spoke with you I was just out of college and I was doing an article for Esquire about young musicians. And uh, I was given your number and you were working in Vancouver. And I phoned you and we, you were very animated and you were talking about how great these young players were. And after about two minutes you said, where are you calling from? And I said, New York. And you said, this phone call must be costing you a fortune. Hang up and I'll call you back. <laughs> I'll never forget that. <laughs> and we were on the phone for a long time. Uh, do you still get excited when you, I mean, you guys grew up. Ellington and Tatum and Parker, do you still get excited when you hear the young players? Very. And last night, uh, I was so impressed with a jazz trio from Poland. And it made me feel so great because they were so tremendous. And they were influenced by us and we by them. They, uh, all seemed to love Chopin. They played a lot of Chopin, and then would turn it into jazz. And they ended the program with a piece I wrote in Poland in 1958 called Dziękuję, which means thank you. And I played that as an encore after we'd played 12 concerts. And they played it, so I thought, well, it's come full cycle. Yeah. I played it in Poland. They're playing it here in Washington, D.C. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, I sort of have uh, mixed emotions because uh, 1950, I was 15 years old, and I was just beginning to ask questions about what is this music called jazz? in terms of performing it. But the high school that I went to, there were many kids in the high school that were walking around singing Charlie Parker solos. Mm. And they were humming Lester Young solos. And when they filled out the yearbook, um, Who Do You Like, Billy Holiday's name was there. And these are 15, 16, 17 year old kids. So while jazz has become international, and while, yes, there are universities graduating um, youngsters with degrees, it is no longer the music of the folks, music of the folk. Uh, when I was coming up, it was. When people went out on a date, average people, I mean, truck drivers, whoever, just average people. We're getting dressed, honey, we're gonna hear a little jazz. Or we're gonna go dance. We're gonna dance to jazz. Uh, and I believe it is still music of the folk. 
but many of the folk are not participating, especially in the, the inner city, the high schools. And many of us are doing work in that regard. So while we're winning some on the international scene, which is great, it is America's contribution to the world, to the world culture, um, we're losing at the 16, 17-year-old inner city. Now, I, I'm from Chicago, so yes, Chicago suburbs, all the cool schools have their jazz bands in the suburbs. But 99% of the kids in, in that area, 90%, are in the inner city. Uh, and they don't have their jazz bands. There are those of us that are putting together groups to go out into the schools to, um, to um, do something about that. Um, so I think the future of our music is in good hands. Because yes, there are hundreds, if not more, of schools, universities, and colleges graduating young kids. But I think it can be better served if it once again could be music of American folk, the, the youngsters. Um, I think many of our stars from the 40s and 30s did not come from universities. Right. Uh, they came from gospel choirs, and they came from the neighborhood, um, and it was truly music of the folk. But I want to ask you about that. Now, you, you guys all have degrees and, and all kinds of education, but um, nonetheless, you learn by doing. You were, you were out there playing with the masters. How can the same experience be equaled by by young musicians in universities all over the country doing the same, memorizing the same solo, doing the same homework, basically learning it that well, way? Well, we have a dilemma here. Okay. And the dilemma is, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we are graduating kids that can play. My goodness, they can play. But they play at special occasions and mm -hmm. special events put together for them to come to perform. When we were coming out, especially in Chicago where I came up, and here. And here, too. Uh, <laughs> there were 10 or 11 clubs, bars, little joints on the west side. There were 12 or 14 on the north side. There were 20 or more on the south side. They didn't pay a lot of money, but some of these very youngsters that we're talking about, after they learn the fundamentals, or while they learn the fundamentals, they could go somewhere and stand up in front of some folk and try their stuff out and sometime on stage with, with a master, sometimes not. Our group, we put together three guys, we were all, well, it was seven to begin with. We were all sort of the same age, uh, but we got the opportunity to try out our ideas and develop our own voice. And I think the health of our music and the future of our music has gotta come from people who put together the uh, knowledge and have done the hard work with, put that together with experience right. before you get to Carnegie Hall, right. before you get to Kennedy Center, before you get to um, the Blue Note in New York, et cetera. And we don't have that. There's a big gap from graduate from college with the piece of paper and Carnegie Hall. Yeah. Big gap. Dave, um, this is true certainly of all three of you. Uh, you have immediately recognizable sounds. Uh, Two bars and you know it's Brubeck, it can't be anybody else. Um, I remember years in, uh, in the 60s, Buddy Tate in an interview, he was asked what is the first thing a young person has to do to play jazz and he said find your own sound. And you know, today, uh, is that still possible? Do you hear that? Are young musicians coming along that you can say right away, there's a thumbprint right that, there, an unmistakable sound? Not a, as much as when I was a kid. Uh, although we did want to copy the great players, uh, I got my own sound when I was young and tried to copy Art Tatum and knew that I couldn't <laughs> and no one else could. So you better find your own niche. But um, I, I did go in my own direction. And part of it was because of World War II, I was removed from the jazz scene for four years. Mm -hmm. 
in Europe and places that I was. When I came back, I couldn't understand what's this. Music is so great and so wild. It's so big, but I better go my own way. I, I can't catch up with all I've missed. So I kind of fell into my own sound. You just raised something I was going to ask, actually, because all three of you in, in interviews going way back, when you're asked who inspired you, who, who did you love, you all say Tatum. So let's talk about that, because I... I do we have what's to? It, yeah, well, what's, <laughs> what's it like... You really want to do that? <laughs> what's it like to be a young pianist in a world in which Tatum still walks the earth? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, one of the things that I found out... Uh, when I was Art's protege, the, uh, he listened to everything. And I remember being, uh, I was working with Eddie South on the West Coast. And uh, we, uh, I would, Art would come by and pick me up at, to the club and we'd go out and hang out. In those days, we'd hang out all night. I mean, so I'd get off at, 10, at two o'clock. It would be seven or eight o'clock before I'd take him home, you know, because right. so we, we'd go to after hour places. And he would go to, to these places, kind of like a, a terrible da dive, really. It wasn't, wasn't very nice. And here's some guy to play the piano. And I didn't think the guy played too well. You know, I, I said, why are we wasting time with this guy? And uh, so uh, Art would never say, no, no, let's, let's go. We're going to the same club and listen. So one, one day after uh, we had spent uh, the night uh, listening to this guy whose name I can't remember, thank goodness. Uh, uh, at any rate, what uh, 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 Art said, uh, remember what he played last night? And he, he, Art sat down and played something that sounded very familiar. I had heard of the guy play, but it didn't sound like that. You know? And what, what Art had done that I couldn't do he listened and he heard things in this guy who was pretty, uh, he, was a, he was a blues player and he played really funky things and very repetitive and, and, and uh, in between boogie woogie and something else and R&B or whatever was going on in those days. And uh, so I heard whatever he did, he got something was exactly what he wanted to hear in terms of what he wanted to do with a blues lick or a, 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 a bluesy jazz lick or what I don't know I don't know what it was really, but it turned out to be the uh, very Tatum S kind of thing, and that was what he heard in in this. And I I heard it after he played it. I, yeah, I heard it, I heard that, but I didn't hear you you know hear him do that right. you know the way you did it. Was it intimidating? Yep. <laughs> it was oh. kidding? Of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the art was, was, was uh, 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 very... I, I remember I, I brought him a re an arrangement one day. I, I said, I've been working... I was still working with Eddie South. I said, uh, I just made this uh, arrangement for Eddie South, and I'm, I'm really proud of it. And I sat down and I played Willow Weep for Me. Well, uh, I, 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 I was very... I did some harmonic things in it, and I was very proud of it. And this is... My mentor, I want to impress him, you know. And so he listened. He said, well, there is a record of Art Tatum playing Willow Weep for Me, which he got <laughs> from hearing me play it. It doesn't, it, you, you wouldn't know anything. You wouldn't know anything. I know it because I, know, I know, know what I played for him. But this is what he got from, from me playing that. I mean, he, he, was, he was a genius and, and really so unusual in terms of uh, being able to, uh, hear things that were uh, um, ordinary things, yeah. but b hearing something beyond what I could hear in those days and, and making some music out of it. Hank Jones once told me that the first time he heard a Tatum record, he thought it was one of those gimmick things where you had overdubbing. Can you remember the fir your first response? <laughs> My first time I heard Art Tatum, I was 12 or 13 years old. My dad was a piano sound lover, he loved piano players, and of course Art Tatum. So he brought a 12-inch 78 home, and I forgot the name of the song, but first of all, I thought it was two piano players, Mr. Art and Mr. Tatum. And, then, <laughs> and when Dad said, no, 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 he called me Sonny, no, Sonny, that, that's, that's just one guy, my heart started. I mean, how could one person do that? By then, I had been steeped in classical music, 
you know, so I had been listening to classical piano players. It wasn't like I hadn't heard intricate piano playing, but it was something about what Art Tatum did that scared, scared me to death. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> okay, now... I put it away. I, I, I wouldn't listen to Art Tatum for another two, three years. All right, now let me ask you the, the political side of this, which is that we know that Art Tatum is one of the absolutely majestic figures in the American music, 20th century music. What percentage of Americans have ever heard of Art Tatum? One percent, maybe? Less. If, if, yeah. Less. Less than one. Less. Percent. Why? What, what, what are we doing wrong? Well, one thing that we're doing wrong is that uh, we are bombarding uh, the ears of everybody with garbage. And, 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 uh, <laughs> and, and, and so uh, if you look at uh, American Idol or you, you listen to many of the things that, that are on radio, you hear music which is not only bad music, but it's badly played. Yeah. And, and uh, it's, it's promoted to the extent that, that everyone says, oh, yeah, let's, let's more of that, more of that. Well, uh, just as Ramsey says, uh, it, you, there's so much music that, that uh, can be listened to and learned if the, the listening is, is directed. That's what I was trying to do on the radio. I tried to, to say to, to people, uh, you know, here is something that caught my ear. I, th I think it's beautiful. What do you think? And sometimes they would agree, sometimes they wouldn't. The, the whole idea, though, uh, of, of having uh, uh, masters like these two is, is, uh, uh, is it's very special what he does, very special what he does, and it, it's it, what each one does, and I did the same thing myself, is that we took what we needed from the masters that impressed us, and we tried to, to put it uh, into usual, usual uh, um, uh, music. So uh, my music and, and David's and, 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 and uh, Ramsey's, is, uh, you can hear the melodies in it because that's what we intend for you to hear on certain things, not everything, mm -hmm. but in, 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 in everything, the ones that we want you to hear, you really hear a melody. Most of the kids that I run into now can't play, they can play a lot of scales, but they haven't been taught to develop those scales into a, a usable melody that which would make sense in terms of, uh, you know, uh, right now it's like everybody's talking in phrases rather than st sentences. Yeah. And, and, you know, you say the same phrase over and over and over and over and over. Well, they, they're better than that. They can play better than that, but nobody seems to, or I'm trying to do it, and I'm sure they are, but yeah. we are a very small, small uh, uh, minority of, uh, of uh, people saying, here are some things that, that you can listen to and, and, and take something away with, with you. But one of the things I, that I notice that's changed, uh, I, that I'm finding out by watching my daughter, who's 18, is that there is no longer, there are no longer bands that everybody listens to, whether it was you know Basie or the Beatles, there was there were bands that everybody in the country knew. Everybody knew Time Out. Now it's like every table at, at in the commissary at college is a group who will listen to a different thing, and they don't even talk to each other if they if they don't like each other's bands, you know that kind of thing. How how did this become so atomized, balkanized? I don't know how it, how it happened, but I hope we can change it. I know that each, other, each, each of us is trying to change it in his own way. And uh, what we're trying to, and I'd like to say what, the, what we're trying to do. We, each one of us, uh, takes the, the, the music of the masters, the people that we looked up to, to whether it's Coleman Hawkins or Leslie Young or uh, Gene Kruper or who, whoever, uh, in the earlier uh, Joe Jones. It, it, it didn't have to be a piano player. Certainly, I learned things from all kinds of people. Dave tells me uh, about uh, uh, people that he heard uh, when he was a cowboy, and, and he, 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 he learned, but he listened to, to Tatum. You know, and, and, and so nothing, he didn't lose anything. Right. He gained something else because it was, took him in a different direction, as, as I did, as, as, as uh, Ramsey did. Were you conscious of the way uh, of deliberately combining jazz and classical and other influences, or is this just something that comes out of who you are? I think that you reflect 
everything you've ever heard. If it's terrible, that's something you're going to avoid. And if it's great, you'll try and use it in some way. Now the way, my mother was a classical pianist. And she, I have two older brothers that were very good classical musicians. The way, she, she hated the idea that I'm gonna play jazz. That there was, that, but that's what I was gonna do. But she was in the car with me when I was maybe 18 years old. And I had on a, a jazz station and Tatum, Art Tatum, played humoresque. My mother said, David, now I know why you want to be a, a jazz musician. But you see, part of that is we're complaining about people not knowing enough about jazz. But they could know more about Bach Yes. And then appreciate jazz. They could know more about Indian music, classical music, and appreciate jazz. But unfortunately, uh, what happened to us in our country? Uh, I came from a school where there were 84 people in the en entire high school. That's not in one class. That's in four classes in a small grammar school. But every Thursday, everybody in the school went to the auditorium and listened to the radio broadcasts. We were given the themes that the classical symphony orchestra was going to play. The teacher had tried to poke out the themes, mm -hmm. uh, may maybe with one finger, but she's trying. All that's gone. And why is it gone? It's not gone in Europe. There's still symphony orchestras in every major city that has a radio station, and they're educating. We've forgotten how to educate people in music. And if they know music, then they come to jazz, or if they know jazz, they go to classical. It's, it's all a big, wonderful thing that you have to cultivate. Now, I'm not saying it isn't cultivated at all, but it's not when I grew up. Our top 40 would be Ellington, yeah. Basie. That's right. Um, it was. It was, wasn't yeah. it? You see what I mean? But I think, it, you know, and I think it speaks to our society. We are too prone to say, yeah, why aren't they doing something? How did they let the schools get to where it is today? It's yeah, a shame. It's oh, it's just a shame. They, they, they. And I think we have to look in the mirror. Most, uh, many of us have to do that to bring culture back to our school system. Parents are very particular about what the kids are putting in their bodies for sustenance, the physical being. Parents are very particular about what people put in their minds to develop, to be a doctor, lawyer, Indian chief. But there's the soul, there's the very being before the doing, the being that we used to cultivate when I was in high school. We had a, 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 a symphony orchestra, mm -hmm. we had a jazz band, a concert band, we had a, a marching band, um, ballet class, class, modern dance class. Um, industrial arts class, a fine arts class, and all these classes we get together, and once a year, there would be a festival put on by the kids. Mm -hmm. There were classes where you learned what a triad is. We, there weren't any private lessons. But what is a chord? What is a melody? What is a scale? So there were certain basic things that six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 year old, especially in high school, were getting a feeling for what's this all about? What is music? And in many instances, they would use Bach, or they would use Beethoven, or they would use Ellington, or they would use 
this music. Well, what is that? Now, here's a, the way Ellington did this, just examples. Mm -hmm. So at a very young age, we were exposed to more than what we heard on radio. There was doo-wop on the radio. But we could compare that to what was going on at a very early age, so that when we did get older, we could make wiser choices. So I put a lot of weight on our society and what we really want. I mean, we listen to radio and say, isn't that terrible? Well, we can do something about it. You know, when the license comes up for these stations renewal, and I'm on radio, you know, people in the communities say, you're not serving our community. Um, there was a time when the FCC's responsibility was to make certain that broadcasters served the diversity of the community. That's right. That doesn't exist anymore. Doesn't we, exist we, anymore. we allowed them to not do this. I was on any NPR when they allowed that. Uh, they went to all, all news instead of the variety of things that they were given money for, from, from the government to do. Mm -hmm. they, didn't, they, they chose not to do that. And, 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 but, but we didn't, uh, just what he said, we didn't complain. We, you know, they, 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 it, it, right. it happened, and everybody said, gee, that's terrible. I remember, you know, fans complaining when New York lost RVR. That's right. That was a terrible thing. I mean, to think that there's not a commercial jazz station in New York. You know, there's listeners sponsored, but as people in the record business keep telling me, you can't buy an ad on listener sponsored. Well, the re record business is, is one of the things that uh, we uh, have been fighting uh, all of our lives in terms of uh, trying to get things that we want done uh, in terms of uh, the, the groups that we relate to. Uh, record business has, has, has been the problem. Uh, when uh, uh, Capitol Records uh, brought the Be Beatles in, uh, Nat Cole, uh, 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 all of the major, Nancy Wilson, all, all of the major artists that were on Capitol Records and I was a very low you know, in, the, in that scale. Uh, we were all, and nobody got, got, got uh, um, anything pressed but the Beatles. They didn't press anything else. Somebody told me once that uh, Nat Cole was a famously even-tempered guy, and the only time they ever saw him get really mad was when he called his office and the receptionist said, Capitol Records, home of the Beatles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. <laughs> Because he was one of the people that helped uh, Capitol, uh, Capitol Records become Capitol Records. That's right. Sure. Well, we have to remember that there was a, during this period, uh, radio stations, television stations, and record companies, Columbia Records, made a lot of money from Barbara Streisand and others. But there was a certain percentage of money put aside to put forth classical music, right. to put forth jazz. And the advertisers on radio, same thing with radio, there was a certain amount of time put aside to, to play classical music, play jazz. But the record companies, the radio stations, the ra and the television stations found that there was so much more money to be made that it became smaller and smaller the amount of money put aside to perpetuate good music. And we, we are where we are now, and that is advertisers totally control media. Mm -hmm. I won't go into record companies at this point. <laughs> That's well, another story. Um, I want to ask you something, though, that, because there's been a lot of discussion here. We've been jazz and classical. Did you have a moment in your life when you felt you had to make a decision? Which way were you going to go? Or did you sort of always? No, no, I, had, I never had a moment in my life. There, there, there were moments in my life where others tried to, to make me make a decision. Um, but um, I still love classical music. Uh, as well as jazz, as well as gospel music, as well as other kinds of music. It's about the melody, it's about the chords, and if I resonate with that piece of music, even if it's just eight bars of that song, I don't care where it came from. So I've never made, to this day, and the reason I said there were people, when our trio first started getting very, very popular, uh, there were those that said, you know, well, what are they? Are they jazz? Well, are they pop? Well, are they? And for maybe 10 minutes, I looked at that, and, and I decided that whatever I am, I'm comfortable with that. And um, it's a wonderful life. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, Ramsey had a, uh, 
uh, one of his biggest he hits right here in Washington, D.C. That's right. It, it was. Yeah, sure. <laughs> what was that? The, well, the, the in crowd took off here. Sure. Oh, that was recorded here? Right here. It was recorded here. I didn't realize that. At the Bohemian Caverns. Yeah. Now, how did that happen? How did, how did they uh, take a trio performance from a nightclub gig and said, we're going to put it on a single? I know, I know. Well, in those days, I think we followed Johnny Griffin and John Coltrane had played the Bohemian Caverns, the loneliest one. I mean, it was the place to play. Uh, and so much so, we wanted that name on an album. So the Chess Brothers said, when you guys play there, we, we should record there, because, you know, Bohemian Caverns. And we had the, the, the album songs, the list all made out. Uh, and we had some Ellington and, and some semi-classical stuff. And, we thought, in those days, I, we call it meat and potatoes, and these are the meat and potatoes. We need a dessert song. Mm -hmm. And what's the dessert song on this one? Um, and somebody said, uh, have you heard the end? I had not heard the end crowd, Don't Be Crazy. But LD and Red, the bassist the drummer, had. Um, and so the decision was to uh, put that on, and we just figured it was just a little ditty. Right. Fun, fun piece. And uh, lo and behold, all our original songs in the Ellington, which is widely received, um, we're fine until we said, oh, we're about to end the set, and we haven't played this new song. And uh, we played that new song, and when you hear it on the record, that was not contrived. I mean, we were just so surprised that people at the Bohemian Caverns, the, the home of straight ahead, right. hard jazz, right. lost it. <laughs> they yeah. wanted to hear that They deep. totally <laughs> lost yeah. it. But th that, that's what he was saying a moment ago about jazz and the community. Uh, U Street was where the community was, and, that, and what, what he was uh, playing was for an audience in that particular neighborhood. Yeah. And that was what that audience danced to and partied to, and, and, and that's what we've lost. This is precisely your point. That's what we've lost. Yeah. We have, uh, to, to uh, uh, every, everything that, that uh, either uh, uh, any of us plays, uh, you can, some, somewhere along the line, you can dance to. Because that, that's the way we, we, we grew up with it. You know, you have to be, you know, the, the, uh, one of the things I had to, to stay, say to uh, kids uh, was, listen, uh, I want you to, to be aware of, of, of two things. I want you to be aware of the fact that you pat your foot, you know, and sometimes you can clap your hands. You know, those two things were in my, my community. Okay. I mean, I, I mean that, that, not that simple, but that, that was all was there. It was in Chicago. It was in the West, in, in the West Coast. It was everywhere. That, no matter what you, what you did, that kind of feeling was there. You don't have to, have to now, you can see the kids in, in anywhere doing that, that because they, they learned that lesson. Right. But they haven't learned where it came <laughs> from. Okay. <laughs> and then on the other hand, there's this guy who writes pieces in 9 4 and 36. Yeah, but you know, you know what Dave does? I'm going to let you talk about that, Dave. And you raise this issue. The three of us believe in melody yeah. right? and, and lyricism. And I think no matter how intricate you get with the time signatures or whatever, That's right. if there's something melodic about it, there's something that brings people in that didn't take um, jazz or music 404 or whatever it was. And, and Dave's music is very melodic, no matter how intricate it gets. Yeah. Is, is it true that Columbia was nervous about releasing Time Out? One year, they avoided it after I recorded it. And they said, you couldn't dance to it. <laughs> They're all originals on one LP. Right. You want a painting on the cover. <laughs> We've never done that. <laughs> And uh, <coughs> it, it will never sell. And the uh, sales department uh, refused to have it released. But here's one thing that um, really helps is if the president of the record company is a musician. Ah. Remember that. <laughs> <laughs> And the president of Columbia heard that. Are you, are you talking about Goddard Lieberson? Goddard Lieberson. Yeah. He was a composer, a musician, completely uh, a renaissance man. That's what you want 
running the place. And he said, give me a copy of that, and I'm going to the West Coast, and I'm going to play it out there for them. When he came back, he said, they didn't like it either. <laughs> <laughs> But he said, I like it, and I'm going to get it out. Now, all the fighting, all, all I wanted to do was to make an experimental record. I had no idea of anything else. Just get away in a different direction for a while. Now, uh, they had to change their mind because they never did like it except the president liked it. But the disc jockeys liked it. So they jumped on it right away? Here in, in Chicago, they were the first to, to jump on it. And the people were phoning in all the time. The lines into the radio station were full when they started hearing Take Five and Blue Rondo. So it's the people that made that thing happen. If right? you give them a chance. Yeah. yeah you, you gave them a chance. Give me, yeah. Not the record company. Record company fought against it. It's still one of their best sellers. And yeah. it's 50 years later, right. maybe more, I forget. How. Well, it's, up, it's just about 50. Yeah. So th there they're fighting something and winning until the public got into it mm -hmm. through the radio stations. I have to ask you, when, when you first recorded that, how did you, how were you mentally thinking in terms of five? I mean, four is like subconscious, right? But are you, are you constantly counting? I mean, how, how do you get into that so that? Bad news to count. <laughs> <laughs> My drummer, Joe Morello. Started that beat, um chuk ka chung boom boom, um chuk ka chung um boom boom, and I told Paul Desmond, uh, while well, I heard him improvising, I said, uh, write out some of your ideas, bring it to rehearsal, and because uh, we can do something in five. You, you know, people were dancing in five in Detroit. I saw the whole ballroom. In five, they didn't know it was five. <laughs> <coughs> but Paul said he couldn't write a piece in five. And I said, well, didn't you write anything down? He said, well, I wrote a couple things. Let me see them. And I said, Paul, I can put these themes together. and We got a great tune. So that's how that tune came about. And then Blue Rondo, die, 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 da, 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 die, die, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, what? Well, that's from Turkey, right. from the street, mm -hmm. street musicians, back to the folk. Yeah. Greeks do it all the time. You did? Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, you can't be controlled by a, a record company uh, too much or they'll kill you. Do you ever, after all these years, just think, I can't play that tune again? Never. No. I, I wish I were playing it tonight, but I'll have to <laughs> I don't, you never I played people, the same. Yeah, right. I don't know why people think that uh, if something is good, you get tired of it. That's that's the the, the one thing that uh, having something which is is uh, catchy and 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 singable or danceable or whatever. Uh, uh, that's why you do that because it, it it does want you. Let me hear that again. Let me play that again. Whatever. But they always say that about jazz musicians. I mean. No one would go to Yo-Yo Ma and say, do you ever get tired of playing a box? Right. <laughs> Don't you get tired? I, I got to tell you a story. Artie, Artie Shaw once told me that he was playing in Philadelphia shortly after Frenesy came out. Frenesy was his big hit. And uh, he had on piano Dodo Marmorosa. Oh, yeah. Some people will remember him. Yeah, yeah. And he was a bit of a character. 
And uh, Artie said uh, they, they, uh, they were into the first set, and somebody in the audience said, play Frenesy. And he said, you know, of course, and they played Frenesy. And uh, the second set starts, and somebody comes over, and uh, he, he thinks, oh, this is going to be all night. And he plays it a second time and a third time. And Marmoroso said, if we have to play that damn tune one more time, I'm leaving. And sure enough, at the end of the night, they had another request, and they played Frenesy, and Dodo got up, and Artie said he never saw him again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to read something. Uh, it, about 20 years ago, uh, Billy Taylor, and, and, uh, and I was honored to be part of this as well, and a number of people in the music world, uh, composers, musicians, critics, historians, were involved in a conference that took place in Racine, Wisconsin, a place called Wingspan. And uh, Billy Taylor, uh, his, his uh, presentation uh, is just an absolutely brilliant, uh, it, it shows not only that he understands jazz, but he understands real politic and the way politics inform it. And this is a paragraph with which he ended his presentation and I, I'm going to read it, and I want to hear you comment on, on what's happened in 20 years. Jazz is on the threshold of a significant breakthrough. If the field is properly motivated, mobilized, and organized, the music can be put into an excellent position of growth and stability. The talent is there, the audience is there, the business acumen is there. We need to fuse those three elements and raise jazz to its proper level of acceptance, support, and financial stability. So how have we done? <laughs> Pretty badly. Uh, we, uh, some of the things that I was asking for on that occasion uh, have been done and, and have been done very well uh, in concerts around the world and uh, in spreading uh, the word uh, of the fact that uh, if you look carefully at the history of jazz, you'll find much to work with one of the problems then, one of the things I didn't say there, is that uh, uh, we really have to think historically of, uh, 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 think, think historically about what's going on uh, to make the idea of uh, jazz come alive as it does, uh, as it did with us in, in, in saying, uh, here is uh, the way Coleman Hawkins uh, played a melody. Here's the way uh, uh, Ben Webster played the melody. Here's, here's the way Johnny Hodges played the melody. Each one of those guys sounded totally different, you know? And, uh, but uh, how do you tell someone what to look, listen for? So you have to experience, I think, the, the, uh, what's going on in, in uh, hearing the music and in feeling the music. Because one of the things that we all do is we have a lot of fun when we play. And, uh, and we play differently, but we enjoy it. Uh, I, 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 I see so many kids who, who just sit and play, play beautifully, and then, uh, you know, I get a, I like to crack a joke or something, and maybe we'll all laugh, laugh again, right, you know? Right. And, and uh, uh, but that's, that in itself is a minority too, because most of the kids, whether they show it, uh, are really enjoying. They, they, they know, they, I can do this. And this is worth my, the effort I, I, I went to to get to the places where I could do it. And so if we could uh, really bottle, bottle that and, and, and really make it uh, the kind of thing that uh, e each one of us is doing uh, something like this. Uh, he, he's, he's doing it in California. He's doing it in, 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 in uh, Chicago. I'm doing it here in Washington, D.C. We're all doing the same thing in terms of trying to say, here is something that we hope this audience will, will like because we think it's worthy. And uh, each one of us pres presents that, that idea quite differently, but it amounts to the same thing. And thank goodness it's getting the same kind of res results. I find it a, a distressing uh, when I teach, and I've just finished writing a textbook, that of, of making this homework. You know, it's like we all followed it because we loved it. We wanted to hear everything and everybody, you know, you bought a Dave Brubeck record, somebody was going to say, oh, you like him, you got to also check out Bud Powell, and you got to hear Hawkins, and you got to hear Bird, and you got to hear everybody. But now it's like, you know, 
who is the clarinetist on the hot five for five points? I mean, it's, or, or they have to listen to the record and diagnose it in a way that frightens them. It's not pleasure. It's not fun. It's not fun. So how do you, I mean, it's the same with teaching classical music. No, it isn't. It's not? No, it's not. <laughs> no, it isn't. Uh, there's a whole uh, uh, idea of how you teach classical music and uh, the, the process that you go historically right. through uh, Bach, Beethoven, and, and the various things like that. But uh, they, uh, when, when, you, when you get to Hinmouth and other people, they, they, they stop writing the book. So th there's, there's, not, uh, th there's nothing that goes with, now what do you do with that? You know? right. And uh, uh, we found things to do with it, and we can do it. But, but we have to share it, and it has to be, uh, you have to bring the audience in with, me, uh, with you, because uh, that's, uh, that's our problem. The, each one of us, in his own way, takes the audience. When, when I play, if there's nobody in the room, or the room is full, it doesn't make any difference, I'm gonna have a good time, cause I, or I wouldn't be playing. You know? And the same thing is, is true. You know, every time I go watch this guy, guy uh, he, he was here at, at the Kennedy Center playing with Wynton Win, Win Marsalis, mm -hmm. and, and, and through Wynton the Curve, and, and Wynton said, huh? And, <laughs> and, 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 well, that's what you're supposed to do. I mean, that, you know. <laughs> We're going to open this to questions in a minute, but I want to ask one final question to all three of you. Um, you all go back, at least as listeners, if not performers, to the 40s. You've seen the coming of, you grew up with swing, you saw the coming of bop, hard bop, cool, fusion, avant-garde, smooth jazz, everything. It, was there anything that especially surprised, astounded, shocked, watching this development that you just said, what is this? Well, I, I think it's the trees in the forest. I think being a part of it, I didn't segment it like that, mm -hmm. realizing that we were coming out of the cool going into the post-bop and out of the post-bop into the contemporary. Out of, I'm it, talking like a critic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we were just playing, and there were those that preferred to play like that, and it's fine for them, and those who played like that, it's fine for them. Uh, so no, there, for me, there was no point during the last 52 years of my performing that I could say well, it was 1942 or 1978 that I noticed and therefore it was wow mm -hmm. I can't remember that Dave it all goes back to Art Tatum <laughs> <laughs> people don't realize that the next big movement in jazz was bebop. Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie, but Parker. And Parker stopped playing for a while so he could wash dishes where Art Tatum was playing. Yeah. So, right. just, it's still a, a development and Art Tatum probably was influenced by Jelly Roll Morton. Each, it, what sounds like it's going forward is going forward because it had come from what had happened before. Right. But you sort of had to think of, like a critic a little bit because you're on the radio. Yeah. You have to make your choices. Mm -hmm. You have to be aware of everything that's going on. Was there ever a moment when you said we're on the wrong track? Or when you heard somebody and said, wow, this is a whole, this is exciting. Well, yeah, I, I, I've on many occasions said this is uh, very exciting because uh, different things happen. Uh, for instance, when Cannonball Adley uh, began to play his version of, uh, version of uh, bebop, that was quite different from what Charlie Parker wrote and what he played. But uh, uh, he had he was he was going somewhere else with that. He 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 acknowledged. He said Bird was the one that really changed me. That's what I'm listening to. I I, I felt uh, on a, on my website now. I've got a thing that, that, that he says that on because he, he I, uh, I played it for someone and they, and they said, well, oh, I didn't know that. It's from a show that we did. And he's talking about uh, bebop and he's talking about how he plays melodically and, and how he does uh, other things and keeping the fact that he's trying to move forward 
He's not saying it's, it's got to be uh, very different. Different. It is very different, but he is not saying, I'm going to consciously make it different. But what he's saying is, I'm trying to make it sound like me. Um, Do we have any questions? Would anybody like to address? We, here we have a gentleman. Uh, how um, is the, the biggest venue for music right now is the internet. How, how, is, how is the internet changing jazz? Or what's the impact that you see on jazz from the internet? It's making people listen to more, uh, a wider variety of things. Unfortunately, the problem with the internet is the same. It's a little different from radio and television. In the, but in the in internet, you get so much and you get so, 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 unless you have somebody guiding you through uh, all of that maze of things, uh, it's, it's kind of difficult because you, you are bound to miss something, unfortunately. And there's no control if so much of our music is, we're not paid for it. Well, there's that. I, you know, I, one of the things that I think has had some kind of a, an impact is the LP was, uh, very human in terms of the amount of music it provided. I mean, anybody could listen to a 20-minute side and then you'd turn it over. And with the CD, because they raised the prices, they thought they were doing you a favor by making every CD 75 minutes. And most people can't listen to 75 minutes without glazing over at some point. So now we're back at this situation where people just download tracks. But that, that's because of, of programming. Uh, if the people who uh, put out the record were not so greedy, they could program, as, as uh, what uh, Ramsey was saying, you program something so that you can listen to two hours of music if, 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 it's, if, it's, uh, uh, if you program. Correctly. Exactly. Yeah. We, we, we would put out our LPs in those days and CDs, as far as we're concerned. One song is there because this song is there, and this song feels good because this song feels good, and it's like a, 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 like a concert. So by the, by the time you've listened to 60 minutes or 57 or six, whatever it is, right. It's presented in such a way, and it's programmed in such a way, it, hopefully it, it keeps your attention. You're reminding me of, uh, I, I visited Jerry Mulligan once, and uh, he had just gotten that day in the mail one of those mosaic boxes, you know, every record he made over a 10-year period in chronological order with all the takes. He was furious. Yeah. He said, you know how much time we spend sequencing so that it's fun to listen to? And then they turn it into like a PhD thesis. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, as a native Washingtonian, I enjoyed so much listening to Dr. Taylor about the early days and the U Street corridor, uh, going to school, I guess, in Dunbar. Tell us a little bit about that and how you got your start at the Howard Theater. If you could share some of that with us, I'd appreciate it. Well, uh, the Howard Th Theater was uh, the, places where I, the place where I could hear all of the uh, music that uh, was current. Uh, when I was growing up, I mean, I heard Chick Webb, I heard uh, Jimmy Lunsford, I heard uh, Mary Lou Williams, I heard everybody that later uh, became an influence on me. And, and this was just in, in my neighborhood. This is what I was talking about earlier. This was in my neighborhood. It was, it was, it was something that was as natural as uh, walking down the hall because uh, I would go uh, um, to the Howard Theater on Friday or uh, on Saturday, actually, because could, could go, uh, uh, it was better to go and, and, and be able to, to stay and uh, than have to go home quickly. But, uh, uh, and it only cost uh, 15 or a quarter or something like that. And I, I heard, uh, I saw a movie and I heard uh, 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 a band and, and a, shoot, a show. I thought every, you know, for, for, for 25 cents, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and, 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 and it was, it was really, uh, uh, it was an education. I didn't know I was being educated, but uh, uh, Washington, like any other place with the Crystal Caverns, uh, which was what it was before, uh, ah. the Crystal, Crystal Caverns, and, uh, 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 and there, was so, there was so much here that uh, to, to top what was going on here, I had to go to New York because there I could hear all of these things that I heard like at the Savoy or, or in, in other, other places because that was the, the larger part of the community that, that we were talking about. And the one thing about it, uh, uh, this, this was a time when uh, 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 everything here in D.C. was segregated. 
So we were, uh, uh, we, where, where I went, uh, I ne anything I needed was right uh, in this very small cor corridor. And uh, uh, there was a lot. There was the Howard University that was there, and there was, there were, there was music, and I heard classical music. When, when George Gershwin wanted to uh, uh, get people to sing Porgy and Bess, he came to Howard University, and, and he, he got uh, people there who could, who could do uh, classically Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what he needed to, to be done in, in what was a pop show for, for them. But uh, they, they had classical training, and that was, it was, was unique to this particular place, to, to Washington, D.C. Most people who live here don't, don't know very much about that, and we're right. trying to educate them a little bit, uh, hopefully. You're, you're <laughs> very associated with Chicago, but is it still true that to, to really have a national reputation, you have to come to New York, or, or is it? Not in my case. I mean, <laughs> well, I don't mean, well you're, you're, but aren't you a rare exception? Well, you know, in many cases, um, musicians went through and still go through that period of local boy does not make good. Mm -hmm. The local boy must go away and then come back. <laughs> right. And, and, and so that became the norm. So, yeah, people would go to New York for a lot of good reasons. And then when the record industry moved to California, people would go to L.A. Uh, for many reasons. But I don't know if many of them accomplished as much as they wanted to in New York because it got to the place where there were so many musicians. I mean, there were, there were thousands of piano players. And they couldn't get past the people who lived there with big names like Billy Taylor and Hank Jones and you name the, the 50 guys that owned the city. Now here comes 500 guys from across the country raising their hand. So it was quite difficult. And um, for whatever reason, uh, I chose to stay in Chicago. And I think we would have been better off in Chicago and Nashville and many other places, New Orleans and wherever, mm -hmm. if more guys did, in fact, stay in their hometown. Or if they did go to New York, come back, mm -hmm. uh, rather than end up uh, doing things they didn't want to do because there's just too many saxophone players, too many piano players. I, I once did a story about a pianist I used to like to hear. I went to college in Iowa, and there was a guy in Des Moines who sounded a bit like Hank Jones. And he said, uh, and I asked him if you know, he's ever worked in New York, he said, if I go to New York, I'm just a Hank Jones imitator. In Des Moines, I am Hank Jones. <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of piggybacking on the last question, I think. But Dr. Taylor, obviously, you're based here. And Mr. Brubeck and Lewis have had no shortage of time spent playing here. I wondered if uh, you'd had a chance to make any observations about the current state of jazz in the District of Columbia. Uh, wait, say, say, that, say that again. If, do you, have you made any particular observations about the current state of the jazz scene in Washington, D.C.? Oh. Yeah. Uh, one of the things about uh, uh, D.C is that you have an enormous amount of uh, music that's being played here, and uh, uh, all of the, uh, the Kennedy Center and all of the other places that present uh, music uh, uh, have done something a little different. Many of them are playing more jazz than they did before. When I first got here, uh, the Kennedy Center was only doing uh, four jazz shows a year, and uh, so we changed that a little bit. And uh, uh, in other places, uh, the people who listen uh, uh, to the music have uh, recognized the fact that we can do a certain amount of things, but there are many things that we have to leave. We don't have the time or the money or, or, or the inclination to do some things, and they can do that. And so many people are coming up with things in this area in which they're uh, presenting much broader uh, uh, aspects of all kinds of music, which is jazz and, and, and many other things. Um, one of the things that you got me thinking about was the fact that you said there, I think you were really aiming at the fact that younger people don't get to even hear jazz, much less play it. Um, and this is more a reaction that I had, and you can react to it. But some years ago, I was up late and I was watching something on cable, and there was this trumpet player playing who knocked me out. I didn't know who he was. Pardon my ignorance, because I'll mention his name in a second. But uh, there were a lot of rock and rollers singing with him at a club in London. 
So Van Morrison sang with this trumpet player and Elvis Costello, which kept me locked into it because I was a rock and roll kid. And it turned out to be Chet Baker. And I had never heard of him, I had never heard his music, but because of the connection between these rock people that I knew well and admired, and the fact that they were playing with him made me go back and get record after record after record and learn his catalog. I'm wondering if that isn't a direction that might make sense. I mean, we see it with Ray Charles doing an album with all of these other people, more current people singing. Now Tony Bennett is becoming a star yet again, singing with people like Nora Jones and people that are younger. I'm wondering if that isn't the direction that, needs, that it needs to go, at least in bringing younger people into the jazz scene. I don't think you have to play down to uh, people. I've never done it, and, and I've uh, uh, been lucky enough to uh, present uh, the, thing, the ideas that I had uh, to a large audience, both on radio and television. And uh, in both of those areas, I found that uh, people were a lot smarter than I thought. And, mm -hmm. they, and they, they really came, they knew a lot more than, than I had given them credit for. And so I figured, uh, you know, if, if, I, if I'm negligent in that area, then I must have a lot of comp competition. There was a concert, and I can't think now what the theme was. It was only either last summer or the summer before, and you played a solo Fantasia on a Coltrane theme. Oh, right. Um, well, I did it on television. No, this was, I think, in Carnegie. This was part of a oh, JVC. Oh, 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 right, right. That's, it was the uh, Nancy Wilson. Right. Uh, right. So and it was Coltrane's Dear Lord. Dear I, Lord. And the yeah. reason I mention it is it was probably the most intricate and abstract piece of, of the entire evening. Oh, well, thank you. And it, well, and it was superb in every way. <laughs> but, but, I mean, that's a good example. I mean, if people thought that you were going to just come out and play Hang On Sloopy, Nobody here is going to be pigeonholed by a hit. He never, he never did that. The, 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 I, I remember you know, before Brubeck uh, uh, got to him, I got to him, and and he, uh, when we st when we do would do things uh, uh, together, people would come up always and say, oh, "Would you play?" And and he'd say, oh, "Not today." <laughs> and, 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 and they would stay and, and just be charmed by the fact that he was playing something totally different from what they had come to hear him. They want to hear him the hits. He said, well, no, if you came to see me, here's what I want to play for you. And, 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 and it takes a strong arm, uh, 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 artist to, to do this. I wish uh, uh, more people would be like these two guys because then we, uh, we wouldn't have so much trouble. Well, Dave, Dave, this <laughs> Dave does with Take Five what I do with the in crowd. I mean, it, it's like the... The, the, the encore? Well, it, it gets people to come, but right. sure. when people... I don't think Dave nor I would be around, or, or Billy, as long as we have. If all we played was, I wish I knew how... Would be free, free, free and, and take five, and I, I thought all I did was the in crowd, uh, which was in 1965. Right. But when we get a crowd, we know what we do, don't we? <laughs> we give them the meat and potatoes, and we give them take five later on, and in crowd later on. Um. Hi. Uh, hi, Billy. It's Beth Cole. How are you? Uh, and uh, we raised money back in a long time ago for jazz. Um, this weekend in Jacksonville, Florida, um, where I live now, there is a um, jazz festival going on. The city sponsors it. Um, it's $10 to go all day. And I think um, the loss of jazz festivals around the country is one of the saddest parts. And also, I mean, the U University of North Florida Jazz um, Orchestra plays at that, so you have the young, and you have the middle, and then you have the older. And there's so few any longer where people can go and get free or very cheap festivals. And would you comment on that? Yeah, I want to add to that by pointing out that when I was in high school, for five bucks, you could be at the Vanguard all night and... Oh, yeah. I mean, kids can't do that now. The prices are... are they're priced for tourists, mostly. Sure. So what do you do? Well... <laughs> oh, that's, that's, a big, that's a big question she, she put forward there. Of, of course, festivals, uh, they have to pay the artist, and uh, the artists have to pay whatever they have to pay. Um, and so somebody has to pay the tab. I think in Jacksonville, maybe, I'm not sure, but in many cities, 
the city steps up. Right. They and, do. You know, and, and, and so the, the uh, citizens can pay 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 dollars when they have uh, three or four or five hundred thousand dollars worth of talent. Right. But they say this is a gift to the city. Uh, I, I don't think in this day and time we can afford to do that. Well, the, the Jacksonville, uh, um, over the years, they've had uh, the, the longest program uh, I think they, they ever did at that particular festival was uh, they did something like 20 hours of, of jazz or, or almost close to well, over 24. I mean, that wasn't over 24. It wasn't a full day. It was almost a full day. And uh, it was a very interesting thing. It had all kinds of dizzy was on it, a lot of... Uh, wonderful uh, people. So they've done very well with that, and the city has really been behind them. But uh, uh, you have to have someone who knows how to program those things, and you have to do to make it continue to, to, to blossom. And uh, I, it's doing well. I'm, I'm happy to report. But I think uh, uh, if it, it, they had help, like Monterey and, and, and some of the other play, if they got together and, and, right. and say, well, we're doing this, you guys are doing that, and you're over there, and, 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 and those kind of things were um, the things and, that could do it. And yet in the European festivals, there'll be they do the, that. the top uh, dollar stadium concerts, and then there'll be something free in the square. Right. But you know, my concern about festivals in Europe and the United States, uh, the, the young man, uh, related, why don't we mix rock and roll and jazz on record? Well, they're, they're doing that to some degree, although it hasn't helped jazz a lot. So a lot of records. But... I know, that's like uh, the Pavarotti's singing Andrew Lloyd Webber. Yeah. It's just so demeaning to yeah. their talent and... Well... Excuse me, Webber fans, but... <laughs> well, um, I don't have an answer here, but I noticed many of the popular festivals are, in fact, mixing top name rock acts who are great in their own respect. Mm -hmm. There's no putting them down. Uh, but what they say is the reason we need five rock acts and six or seven jazz acts is because jazz people don't show up anymore. Um, and and that, that could lead to something down the line that could be ugly. I think we have time for two more. Yes. Uh, I got, I guess, more of a historical question. Uh, Mr. Br Brubeck, you used to play and um, tour with racially integrated groups before that was really an acceptable thing to do. And I wanted, wondered if you would talk a little bit more about what that experience was like. And also, if you felt like doing so, you were able to play an important part in the civil rights movement. That would take a whole chapter or a book. Um, when, when, um, you get to the point where people are talking about integration. You just have to go back to some of the earlier bands, like Louis Armstrong. And when he was asked about that, he had one of the great trombonists, Jack Teagarden, was with him. And his answer was so simple. Jack T. Garden is my brother. Another time he was questioned, and he said, cats, because he called all of his yes, cats. Right. <laughs> cats of any color. <laughs> and we had such friendship. The great players were so helpful. To Billy, Billy didn't say that he worked with Art Tatum. I had to open for Art Tatum, which is the scariest thing a man can do. <laughs> <laughs> Did it ever scare you? Of course. <laughs> Since you mentioned Lewis, I have to ask you, uh, because I love real ambassadors. It's, I just think it's an extraordinary thing. I was talking about this with Mrs. Brubeck a few minutes ago. I, I always wondered why, when it's reissued, as it was a few years ago on CD, we never get to see the whole libretto. I mean, I want to know the plot. I know the songs. Yeah. So do I want to see the libretto. <laughs> That's uh, because my wife 
really captured what was going on. Uh, the quickest way to tell you how I feel about it, when my wife gave Louie the music, he wrote across it, am very happy, Mrs. Brubeck, Satchmo. Mm. Would you tell the story about the piece that you said you wrote for an easy laugh? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I wanted people to laugh about a very heavy, deep situation, segregation. And I'd been told I'm hitting it too hard on the head. Uh, on Broadway, they wouldn't produce it. And they said, we do entertainment and you're trying to educate and lecture to the public. So I, that stuck with me a bit. And so when Iola and I did The Real Ambassadors, right from the beginning, I was gonna make a statement, but make it funny. So you wanna hear this story, I'll tell you. Lambert, Hendricks, and Ross, were in sackcloth, but they had a hood that they could pull up over. And when they'd sing a Gregorian chant, they'd pull up the hood. When they were finished and doing jazz, they'd put it down. It worked very well. So the opening statement, I was hoping to get some laughs and take it easy. Now, they have the hoods up, like a Gregorian chant. God created man in his image and likeness. In his image and likeness created he them. And Louis starts singing the blues. Mm -hmm. They say, I look like God. Could God be black, my God? If both are made in the image of thee, could thou perchance a zebra be? <laughs> now there were three or four thousand jazz people in the audience. When Louis delivered that. I hoped those people would react just like you did. This is the crazy thing about an audience. How do they all telegraph to each other? We're going to stand up. We're going to boo. We're going to riot. They, they, they move like fish in, in the sea. <laughs> there isn't a laugh. Monterey Jazz Festival. And Louis is crying on something where we thought we'd make it easy and fun. No way. Every time in that piece where we were making a statement, it could have been funny. Louie never went that direction. He was serious. And uh, it, it just his whole soul went into that piece. He, he was 65 years old and had to learn a whole new thing. He said, the Brubecks wrote me an opera. Well, okay, that's one of the greatest compliments we could ever get. But it wasn't, but that's how he felt about it. And so many times, he had tears in his eyes when we were hoping it could just come down. When we were finished at the Monterey Festival, you have all these people that have just played all weekend, jazz musicians and critics. Guys that hated me came up and were crying. Mm -hmm. Critics that couldn't stand me for about 40 years. <laughs> they finally got the message that, that night. 
And Dizzy Gillespie just threw his arms around my wife and I, and he was crying. And it, it was so moving because Louis was saying what he really felt in his heart. And when God tells man he's really free, no, not me, no, not me. I don't think we can follow that, and we're over time. I, this has been a thrill for me, and I want to thank all of you for being here, and all of you for being here. Um, Ramsey Lewis, Dave Brubeck, Dr. Billy Taylor.